For over a thousand years, one weapon has dominated the battlefields of Japan. A weapon so fearsome that it can split a man from throat to groin. Yet it spawned an entirely new art form and spiritual way of life. A sword so technologically perfect in structure, so beautiful in creation, that it gave rise to an aristocratic warrior creed. There is no weapon anywhere else in the world that seems to be regarded as having a spirit of its own. To me, the Japanese sword is the ultimate sword in the world. It has everything a perfect weapon should have. Now, intimate access to the foundries, swordsmiths and fighting schools can reveal what makes the so-called perfect sword. And on the inside, the science of centuries-old secrets that give this blade terrifying sharpness and formidable strength. A no-holds-barred look at one of the most iconic man-made objects ever forged. This is the inside track on the making of the legend that is the Samurai Sword. The birth of the Samurai Sword dates back to before the 10th century, when elite Japanese warriors served feudal warlords. Called Samurai, which means those who serve, they rose in power and prestige. Only certain men, selected from the aristocracy, became samurai. It meant a lifetime of training and discipline that would set them apart from the rest of society. To be a samurai meant honor, pride, the feeling of being an elite. You were certainly the best because only the best were chosen. For historians like Dr. Stephen Turnbull, above all, the samurai blade created the legend. Allegedly strong enough to slice a body in two, but also precise enough to cut a single human hair. And designed to cut from the moment of release from its sheath, it inspired a whole new way of fighting. For many, the katana sword developed in the 16th century has the perfect combination of balance, artistic beauty, plus a sharpness in its cutting edge. Shimane in southwest Japan hides a place that still makes the metal for true katana swords. Called the home of the gods, this area has rare mineral ores vital in the forging of a unique type of steel. The birth of every katana sword takes place in a crucible of fire, at the bottom of an iron furnace. Called Tatara, this one is a rare traditional smelting furnace, the last one in Japan. The secrets of this age-old craft fascinate modern metallurgists like David Starley. The traditional Japanese smelting furnace is what's known as the Tatara. It's about three meters long by about a meter wide and one to two meters in height, with a row of air inlets or tweers along one side. Kihara Akira is one of the last remaining traditional Tatara masters in the world. He won't sleep for three days and three nights as he watches the furnace work on the dark materials for the world's sharpest swords. Compared to ordinary iron ore, the iron sand found locally is incredibly pure. It contains far less impurities like sulfur and phosphorus, which make iron and steel brittle. 
The magic starts when the carbon in the charcoal combines with the iron sand to form a unique type of steel. The Japanese call this raw steel Tamahagane. Within an hour, the iron sun sinks to the bottom, to what we call the bed of fire. When we look at the bed of fire, we can clearly see from the color whether or not it has become Tamahagane. Partly because it never gets completely molten, this raw steel retains chemical and physical properties essential to the katana sword. First, at the atomic level, a small amount of carbon is retained. Just enough to give the legendary sword its first must-have quality. The carbon provides inbuilt shock absorption to withstand huge punishment when fending off blows. But a good sword needs to be more than just flexible. Metallurgist David Starley is an expert working with the Royal Armouries in the UK. This is actually a, a fairly pure iron. As we can see, it's very ductile. We bend it, it stays put. It's quite tough, it, it won't shatter, it's not brittle, but it's not very good for retaining the edge. So the katana is also given a pure steel outer edge with low levels of impurities like sulfur. The result, razor-like sharpness. The unique arrangement of iron and carbon in the katana sword gives hardness plus flexibility. And in the hands of a trained samurai, a power that seems to transcend its size and weight. Yeah! Japanese sword makers perfected this art hundreds of years ago. Heating to over 1,000 degrees centigrade combines hard steel and soft iron into a bimetallic blade. Very interestingly, this hacksaw blade is labeled as being bimetallic, and this has the same features that you would find in a thousand year old Japanese sword blade. By the end of the second day, the furnace has already eaten up two-thirds of 26 tons or so of charcoal and iron sand. The furnace is like a human being. We can think of the iron and coal as food. We feed her, she digests it, so that she will bear good tamahagane. For a man in his 70s, Kihara maintains an incredible passion for a tough job. Slowly, the hot iron eats away the walls of the furnace. Beneath it lies a chamber three meters deep. Any moisture seeping in from the ground would lower the temperature, ruining the precious steel. They would have to start all over again. Layers of ash and charcoal raise the furnace above ground, and two ventilation channels flank either side. At temperatures of over 1,000 degrees, any impurities sink to the bottom of the chamber, leaving behind the pure steel. With no modern tools to guide him, Master Kihara will listen to the noise of the fire. Their little shrine is devoted to a sacred deity the smelters believe helps keep them safe. After 36 hours of feeding the voracious fire, everyone is exhausted. There's more than just this new batch of steel at stake. In their own way, these men work to keep an old culture from going extinct. On the morning of the fourth day, he decides it's time to break up the furnace. I could see the core. It looks good. There's a big relief. I'm happy. But no one can afford to relax yet. Until they get the steel out, 
there's no way of knowing if it's samurai sword grade or only good enough for knives and forks. Ten men have worked continuously for three days and nights. But has the chemical reaction between iron and carbon inside the furnace worked to forge steel good enough to make one of the world's finest swords? It's a tense time as the walls of the furnace come down leaving behind a blistering mass that looks like molten lava. It took around 26 tons of iron ore and charcoal to produce this crude steel they call tamahagane. If it's of the right grade, it could fetch around $50,000, which is around 50 times more expensive than ordinary steel. The furnace master, Kihara Akira, must now choose which bits are good enough to go to the sword maker. It all comes down to the carbon content of the steel. Too little carbon, and the finished sword could be soft. Too much, and it could end up brittle. The areas along the sides of the block, where sufficient oxidation has occurred, offer the best prospects. At the University of Leeds in the UK, Dr. Stephen Turnbull specializes in samurai history. One remarkable thing about samurai swords is none of the great swordsmiths could probably write down what it was about the composition of the steel he was using that was so good. But somehow they got it right. And so that, combined with the way the sword was used, set a standard of perfection that was to last for centuries. <laughs> It's like when your child is born, it was worth waiting for. I'm very happy. Thank you. Having made his selection, the choice pieces of the Tamahagane are put to the test in Sakurai, a small town in the middle of Japan, 50 kilometers from Kyoto. Sakurai is home to one of Japan's most renowned swordsmiths, Gasan Sadatoshi, whose family has been swordsmiths for 800 years. But it's more than a profession. It's a spiritual way of life. They took their name from a holy mountain which they climbed to pray to Buddha before forging a new sword. They also brought this spiritualism into the forge, as Britain's Royal Armoury's senior curator, Ian Bottomley, explains. The forge in which he works is regarded as a sacred site. And most of them have a Shinto shrine somewhere within them to which the smith prays every morning before starting work. The pieces of raw steel arrive from the smelters 300 kilometers away. Together with his son and assistant, Gasan carefully examines the Tamahagane to see if it is up to scratch for his next sword. He's looking for heavy pieces with a bright silver color. Any bits that are grayish black and coarse are rejected. The great swordsmiths of Japan were far more than just blacksmiths. They weren't just people who bashed metal into a sword shape. They were more like alchemists. They were steeped in the mysterious traditions of the, the metal, how it was melted, how it was molded, how it was beaten. They may not have understood the chemical composition of it, but from years of practice, years of apprenticeship, and years of tradition passed on from master to pupil, they were able to transform this mystery into something that was very, very real, the samurai sword. And there is really still only one way to learn the art of sword making, through apprenticeship not a career path anyone should take lightly. For Gassan's apprentices, it takes several years just to learn the basic skills of sword making. They live on site, help with household chores, 
and work with their master for six days a week. To begin with, they just concentrate on the charcoal and furnace. They then graduate to forging techniques. But after a few years, they get to start on their own swords. But for the lucky few that do qualify, it will take at least another five years before they can call themselves a master swordsmith. Forging of this new katana will take three men more than three months to complete. Heat from the forge and constant hammering flatten the pieces into the building blocks of the new weapon under Gassan's watchful and highly trained eye. I can see the amount of carbonization on the edges of these little pieces. This is very important when choosing the right pieces for the proper steel. The selected pieces then get wrapped in paper and a light covering of clay and ash to prevent oxidation. Reheating to 1300 degrees centigrade prepares the steel for hammering, which welds all the pieces into one. They have to work quickly before the temperature drops, making the steel impossible to work with. The hammering also drives out any remaining impurities. The finished product will weigh almost 50% less than the raw materials. The embryo of the katana finally takes shape as a single welded block. But not until it is repeatedly folded and beaten to spread the carbon content more evenly will the metal for the sword really start to come into its own. What this process of folding really involves is mixing the iron and steel so that the block is uniform, more or less throughout its whole structure. All done by hand, the process is impressively accurate. The carbon content ends up at a more or less uniform 0.7% throughout the block. Gassan gauges the concentration of carbon by the color of the steel. A dozen or more folds creates over 5,000 individual layers per one centimeter of steel. It is these layers that produce a pattern called the yihada, the skin of the metal. Slowly the layered block takes shape as a weapon fit for a samurai warrior. In the right hands, the genius of the swordsmith is deadly. A sword forged with not one, but two kinds of steel. Hard and ultra sharp on its cutting edge, but with a softer, flexible core. <laughs> Professor Inoue of the Fukuyama University explains this logic. If you forge a sword from very hard steel, you make it sharp, but it'll easily chip and even break. However, if you use soft steel, your sword may not break, but it won't get very sharp. Japanese swordsmiths understood this contradiction. The triumph of the, the Japanese sword maker is to combine iron and steel together. Hard material on the edge, more ductile material on the back of the blade. Toughness and hardness. Two distinct qualities that make the katana among the sharpest and most resilient swords ever made. The blending of the two metals is the next stage in the process. The hard cutting edge, high in carbon, is made from steel which is wrapped around the lower carbon content, more ductile iron, that forms the heart of the blade. The overall structure of the outer steel, known as perlite and ferrite, is very hard. But the Japanese swordsmiths take their swords one step further. The secret of their skill lies in working on the microstructure of the metal. Down the microscope, what we see is a mixture of the different components. 
Uh, in the interior or towards the back of the blade, we may have pure iron, such as this sample here. And we can see plain white grains of what we call ferrite. What we need, though, for the, the cutting edge of the blade is something that's harder than just steel. This is a structure known as martensite, and its appearance has been likened to seeing straw on snow. It's very hard material altogether, and it's ideal for the cutting edge of an object. Never intended as a stabbing weapon, the katana's edge was all important. This led to some unique methods to test a blade for sharpness, particularly during peace times, when if you were a criminal, you might end up as a human guinea pig. Depending on the severity of your crime, you might lose an arm, a leg, or worse. Carefully inscribed on some swords, you can still find records such as the name of the tester, the date, or the number of corpses cut with a single stroke. At Gassan's workshop, delicate work of a different kind is underway. A secret mixture of clay and charcoal powder pasted over the surface will insulate and protect parts of the blade during the hardening process. This insulation line, an art form in itself, is known as the hamon. The clay is mixed with charcoal. I use it to bring out the line we call hamon. The creation of this line doesn't just show the skill of the swordsmith. It's also an expression of his creativity and it gives every sword a unique character. Where the softer steel core meets the hard edge of the blade, a clear line is visible. Metallurgically, what this is, is it's a, a microstructural phase between the martensite and the perlite that contains elements of both. And when the sword blade is polished, this can be seen as an area that doesn't take on a proper mirror finish. Gassan darkens the forge so that he can judge by the color of the metal exactly when the sword edge has reached 800 degrees. Too hot and the steel might crack. Too cold and the hardening would fail. Gassan is ready to pull the sword at a moment's notice. Only when the color of the blade turns to the red of the rising sun is the katana ready to receive its soul. When the blade's then heated to red heat, it's quenched into water, and those parts only covered by a thin layer of clay cool very rapidly and become very, very hard. During the hardening process, the katana slowly comes to life. Rapid cooling along the edge only thinly coated in clay traps the carbon within the steel into a highly stressed state. This forms the sword's cutting edge. The main body of the sword, covered with thicker clay, cools down more slowly and keeps its more ductile quality. These structural changes during the cooling process bend the sword into its iconic shape. Gassan now starts on one of the last stages of creating his sword, the rough polishing. He determined the size and outlines of the blade when he first designed this sword. He now sets to work grinding the contours and begins to bring the edge to its razor sharpness. The sword will eventually go for final polishing to a master polisher, but at this stage, Gassan can see if it has any defects. He would not want to pass anything but a perfect blade to a fellow craftsman. Today, Tokyo is the world's largest metropolis. It is also one of the most technologically advanced cities in the world. And the location of the final stage of a thousand-year-old craft of sword making. 
Master Honami is a 14th generation sword polisher, one of the most revered and respected in the world. He will undertake the third and final stage in the sword making process. The polishing process was the job of a specialist, particularly in later centuries, and his task was to sharpen the sword, to give it its final shape, and also to reveal all the structures that were built into the sword during the forging and hardening process. Every individual katana sword requires different kinds of special polishing stones. To select these, Master Honami draws on his encyclopedic knowledge of every swordsmith school in Japan. In the 14th century, there were five swordsmith schools. Incredibly, there are still five today. Good stones are rare and can cost thousands of dollars. He looks carefully for the hidden beauty within every individual sword. After 10 days of polishing, he moves on to one of the finest grades of stone of all. The Yizuya stone is cut small, sometimes no bigger than a grain of rice. Although he keeps the blade's edge turned away from his body, it takes extreme concentration to rub these grains against some of the sharpest steel in the world. Katana is very sharp. When I was younger, I used to cut myself a lot. Even these days, I'm still very nervous. Next, Master Honami begins with what's called the whitening of the blade. This will reveal the line where the hard and soft steel meet. Hour by hour, the polisher exposes the inner beauty of the metal. Now he turns his attention to the tip of the blade. We say that making the tip is like applying makeup on your face, because the tip of the sword is what you show to the world. The samurai's katana was not only a beautiful weapon, it was a symbol of power and position in Japan's complex social structure. A samurai actually wore two swords at all times as a visible sign of his untouchable authority, the katana and the shorter wakizashi. Respect was demanded because they were the aristocrats. They were the, the rulers. They were the ones that the farmers grew rice for, the merchants traded goods for, the actors entertained and the priests prayed for. But they were also feared because, theoretically at least, they were the only members of the Japanese population who were allowed to bear arms. The samurai and his katana were inseparable. Only death would part him from it. It was his soul. During the 17th century, a book was published called Hagakure, which is the classic text of what it meant to be a samurai and how one was expected to behave. It contains the chilling phrase, the way of the samurai is found in death. And in a sense, this sums up the whole of the samurai ethos. That the samurai's life was a preparation for death. Samurai warriors took this code of conduct very seriously. They avoided failure, surrender, and dishonor above all else. Death was far preferable. Oh, 
Samurai suicide, or seppuku, which is another reading of the popular term harakiri, is absolutely fundamental to understanding the samurai ethos. The ultimate crime for a samurai was disobedience. He paid for his crime with his own hand. The code that had given him purpose would now end his life. If the samurai had served his master well, he could ask a loyal companion to assist him in his death by chopping his head off at the point of extreme pain. The Royal Armouries collection in Leeds in the UK is home to almost every example of sword ever made. And it now plays host to an experiment that will pitch two iconic swords against each other. The curved samurai sword from Japan versus the straight European broadsword. The broadsword was an ideal cutting weapon, the katana ideal for slashing. So which one is best? With the abandonment of the feudal system, testing swords on corpses was obviously out of the question. <laughs> and as a result, substitutes to human bodies were found. And what we're doing today is testing it on bundles of straw. Straw is a good approximation for the density of human bone. Our samurai contender goes first and easily slices through. And interestingly, the European broadsword, even with its blunter edge, does just as good a job. But European-style swords never caught on in a big way in Japan. European swords that appeared in Japan had no effect because the Japanese certainly recognized that they weren't forged in the same way as Japanese blades and, quite frankly, regarded them as inferior. Similar cutting performance, but very different fighting techniques. The broadsword relies on brute strength and the samurai on speed and fighting finesse. But by the 16th century, a new weapon appeared that challenged both sword and warrior and would change the face of warfare forever. In Japan, guns fired by non-elite soldiers forced the samurai off the battlefield. <laughs> But it wouldn't be the end of the way of the warrior. Long after the demise of the samurai class, the spirit of Bushido, the way of the warrior, survives in modern Japan. Sword schools flourish, and the secrets of the katana remain as alluring as ever. Eighty-year-old Otake Sensei is one of the world's finest martial arts experts and has attained the highest ranking grade in the art of samurai fighting. But before he passes on his 30 years of knowledge, all his pupils must swear an oath of blood never to reveal any of the secrets of the martial arts. More importantly, they swear always to conduct themselves in the true spirit of the samurai code. Otake Sensei teaches at the Katori Shinto Ryu, which was founded over 600 years ago. But before his pupils test out the science of the katana, they must first master the basics of one-to-one -one combat. 
When you fight, you should never have the sun in your face. You should always keep the sun or the moon behind you. You can use it to blind your enemy. The best warrior is one who can turn circumstances to his advantage in the fight. Just here, the armor is weak, so it's a good target. Okay, take your position. You should attack here and here, at the arteries and at the heart. If you cut from the other side, you won't reach them. So attack here, or attack the neck. Of course, you can just step aside. But when you block the opponent, you should always use the back of the sword, because that's the hardest part. There are many, many marks on the blunt side of the sword. This is caused by constant use to block the opponent's blow. So you should use the back of the sword to attack, like this. Only if you practice again and again will your body remember. You have to be so good that you can think about going to work the next day and still be able to fight. But that takes a few years. By day, Midori Tanaka is a receptionist for an electronics company. Her ancestors were samurai. By night, when her workday is finished, she boards a train with her sword. Midori's father, Fumon Tanaka, is a grand master swordsman from Osaka who has devoted his whole life to studying and practicing the fighting arts of the samurai. I think many Japanese people can still find the spirit of the samurai in their hearts. We have started to judge everything with money, or if you own a big house or drive a nice car. But the spirit of the warrior was different. Honor was more important. To give your best at all times was important. This is the spirit of Bushido that we should not forget. Today, his house is a haven for those who would follow this code. Midori visits three times a week to train. For the last thousand years, usually only men were trained in these martial arts. Midori started training when she was a small child and hopes one day to replace her father as Grand Master. I think that we live now in a society where women don't have to hide anymore. But I don't feel that I have a special role in this fighting school just because I'm a woman. I want to pass on the knowledge that I received from my masters. And Midori is my only child. I was very happy when she decided to learn the old way of martial arts. If she hadn't gone this way, I'd have to choose somebody else to give my knowledge to. Midori has advanced to the point where she now practices with a real sword, not a wooden one. This leaves no margin for error. Through martial arts, you learn to overcome your fear. If you can reach the state of Mushin, which means no mind, you can be ready to fight at any time, even without fearing the possibility of death. And who best to display this elusive mental state than the master himself? 
Tanaka prepares to show what the samurai meant by being at one with their swords and showing no fear. And why their lives depended on the quality of the blade. He will take the ultimate test when his daughter aims an arrow straight at his heart. Will his years of dedication and training protect him? Can his sword save him from a speeding arrow? Light, perfectly balanced, and hard enough to cut through armor. In the hands of a fully trained samurai, the katana is the ultimate weapon for close combat. But what made the samurai and his sword a formidable fighting unit was this ability to not fear death. Samurai were trained in the art of meditation to reach a state of mind known as Mushin. Fumon Tanaka now faces his daughter's arrow. In a contest against the bow and the sword, these lethal arrows can penetrate a board over one centimeter thick, more than enough to kill a man. It's not only Master Tanaka's ability to react in the face of a speeding arrow aimed at his heart, but also the sharpness of his sword that means he stands a chance of being able to sever it in mid-flight. The samurai's katana is proof of man's ability to strive for perfection. It is the culmination of generations of swordsmiths working across hundreds of years in a pursuit for the finest blade in the world. And these swords didn't go unnoticed when American troops occupied Japan during the Second World War. During the war, thousands of Japanese officers had a sword. Even kamikaze pilots died with them by their sides. So great was the demand for these warriors' weapons that the sword went into mass production. They were mostly poor quality imitations, not made in the traditional way, but merely drop forged from cheap steel. Although it's just possible that some true katana swords made it across enemy lines. When the war ended, a large number of Japanese swords were surrendered or confiscated from Japanese prisoners or from the dead on battlefields. And just as the Japanese were very loath to part with them, so American GIs were very eager to acquire them. But among the hundreds of ordinary swords, that were taken back to the States as souvenirs. There were a certain number of national treasures, ones made, if you like, of imperial quality. And who knows how many of these treasures actually lie in American homes that were taken back without the owner knowing what a prized possession he'd acquired. Over half a century later, the katana remains the finest sword ever made. It's an object of great beauty, a symbol of honor. Although these ancient values have modern day price tags. The Tuken Shibata Gallery in Tokyo proudly displays its samurai swords. Perfection comes at a price starting at around five to $25,000 for a good sword and rising to over $50,000 for a famous one. Even if you can afford one, gallery owner Mr. Shibata doesn't sell to just anybody. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but the sword is still the soul of the samurai. I don't sell them to just anyone. It's important for me to get an understanding of the client. 
to feel like I can trust them. It's now three months since Gasan Sadatoshi finished forging his sword. Master Honami, the polisher, is also done. It's the moment of truth. Time to inspect the results of half a year's work involving 15 men. A sword that I spent so much time on to see it finished with all its characteristics brought fully to light. It leaves me speechless. Made in the 21st century by strictly traditional methods, this katana sword is the embodiment of centuries of knowledge. In one perfect blade, it combines the resilient soft qualities of iron with a hard, razor-sharp finish of steel. The polish, both exquisite and lethal, for many, it's the hand weapon of choice. To me, the Japanese sword is the most effective sword in the world. In my opinion, the Japanese samurai sword is the finest sword ever made. Even today, the samurai and his way of life continue to inspire new generations. 1,000 years of discipline, unswerving devotion, and peerless skill are values that Japan still holds high. And the legend of the katana sword lives on.